So um, next up, we've got Pete doing his talk on um, OpenAI and Azure Search. So yeah, over to you, Pete, and take it away. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, yeah, so um, thanks very much for coming along. Uh, in fact, I'm just going to stop sharing and just share again, just one sec, and click this, and that will become apparent. Well, you don't, didn't see what I actually clicked, but you'll you'll see what I did in a second. So yeah, uh, this is a talk about uh, how you can supercharge your data with um, Azure AI Search, which used to be called Azure Cognitive Search up until quite recently, uh, and Azure Open AI. So uh, a little bit about me first. Um, I'm a full stack dev manager at uh, Avanard. So I've been there just over a year now, actually. But before that, I worked for myself running my own IoT consultancy, uh, which is why I'm an Azure and uh, IoT uh, MVP that you can see there on that second line. Uh, I'm also a Microsoft certified trainer and a Pluralsight author, and I run meetups and speak at events like this, a podcast podcaster and a STEM ambassador, and I like to keep myself busy, it seems. Lots of different things that uh, that I like to do, but uh, similar to um, what Maria and Anastasia, at least the conversation we had at the end is about, I quite like the enablement part. So helping people to to make a start in either in tech uh, generally or in the, uh, in the areas that I'm interested in. And generally these days, it's either gonna be about IoT uh, or AI, uh, although I've been doing desktop programming for well as long as I can remember uh, an IOT since there was wasn't an IOT so that old so um tell you what we'll do just before we get started um let's see if we can get um Azure uh, open AI to write this talk for us so if we say write me a talk about supercharge your data with Azure AI Search and Azure Open AI. Uh, what's it going to say? Oh, I'm sorry, but I can't do that. Uh, I'll tell you what, what about if I drop some data onto this that might help it? A PDF. So data added and new responses available. Let's copy my original question then and see what it can do now that we've added some data. Let me talk. Uh, sorry, I can't perhaps ask Clippy. Yeah, no, I don't really. Oh, no. Now we've resurrected Clippy. Things are going bad. And Clippy wants to help. No, no, not for me. Ah, oh, oh, no. No, now we've gone back to Windows XP era and everything's gone wrong. It's terrible. Oh, I love that response. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know that was a little bit silly, but actually it highlights a good point in that OpenAI and uh, LLMs in general, large language models, are great, but they, they're they not trained on your data. They're trained on the corpus of the public internet. So things like Stack Overflow and GitHub and Facebook and, and X uh, and books and things like that, but not necessarily your data and you know most definitely not your private company data. Um, but this talks about how we can bridge that gap. Um, but first, we need to do some level setting. So if we ask inception like, if we ask um, Azure Open AI what generative uh, AI actually is, and if we zoom in, this line kind of explains it for me in that it's, tr it's a deep learning algorithm that's trained on large data sets, and it can generate content based on patterns and rules learned from that data. So, um, we'll dive into, into what all of this means. Now, for this talk, we'll be talking about LLMs or large language models generally. Uh, and these things are normally used for general AI work, so chatbots and natural language understanding and things like that. And of course, ChatGPT, everybody's heard of that. But since that was released publicly, everybody has now jumped on the LLM bandwagon where Google have got Palm and Bard and Gemini now, their, their new model. Meta have got Llama and X, um, formerly known as Twitter, has got Grot. And of course, we have um, OpenAI, ChatGPT. Um, within that, though, we break these models down into specific use cases where most of us are going to be using the, the GPT 3.5 or 4 models for basic natural language interactions, conversations, asking questions, and things like that. 
but there are other models for specific use cases like ARDA for embeddings. And we'll talk about embeddings um, in detail in a bit. And then we get uh, things like DALI for image generation and we get Whisper for interaction using voice and things like that. Uh, but for the purposes of this talk, we'll be concentrating mainly on that uh, GPT uh, and embeddings models. So where does Azure's OpenAI flavor of this come from? So we've used ChatGPT, we use it in the web, uh, but of course, Microsoft have heavily invested in, uh, in OpenAI, we know this. And so we can spin OpenAI up as a service in Azure. And we get the exact same models that, that we would through ChatGPT. In fact, we get a little bit of access to, to some more than you would do. Um, but what we also get is those layers of Azure services that, that we're used to. So things like the security settings, virtual networks, private links. But we also get Microsoft's work with responsible AI. And this is about putting guardrails in place to make sure that Firstly, the users don't start veering off and asking questions they, they shouldn't be asking. You know, like generate me a Windows XP product code, things like that. But also that the model itself doesn't then start steering into areas that you wouldn't necessarily want uh, folks to be asking questions about. So the, these guardrails, this responsible AI um, is a really great framework to make sure that this open AI model does what we want it to do. Okay, you can't trust your output. Yeah, well, that's true. Uh, well, I mean, this this is a, a point we'll come to later, but you always must make sure you vet your responses. It's it's a prediction engine. It doesn't know what it's saying, really, for the most part. Um, what we get with OpenAI as an Azure service as well is that we get a fully featured multi-language SDK. Now, you can interact with OpenAI using an API if you wanted to, uh, but if you're a C Sharp or a JavaScript or a Python developer, then you can just use that um uh, sdk to be able to shortcut a lot of that work and get straight to developing and you'll see it reduces the code down quite a lot so what i like to do is do lots of demos in the middle of my talks so i don't leave all the demos till the end so we'll level set all of these so let's start with open ai so i've got multiple different desktops set up and loads of windows open and stuff like that so i'll probably get lost at some point but i'll find my way back so what we have here is the landing page for the OpenAI service in Azure. Now, I'm assuming that most folks have seen uh, Azure. They'll, they'll have been in, into the portal and seen this. But if you haven't, this is a standard looking portal page for a service where we get the overview section, uh, details about uh, the service itself and the subscription, where it is, and then some helpful links down here. So there's not much D as far as usability is concerned here. We do have some keys and endpoints, and these are important because we need these to be able to interact with our open AI service. Uh, miss the last 50 minutes? Yeah, it'll be on YouTube, so that's great. Uh, don't worry, you'll be able to catch up. Uh, so I'm just keeping an eye on the chat as well to see what, what folks are saying. Uh, so these, these keys, uh, you'll only need one of them, uh, but you'll need the endpoint and the key to be able to interact with the, uh, the open AI service using the SDK. Uh, and then the only other pay, um, panel in here you need to worry about is model deployments, but you'll see kind of looks a bit like a dead end. There's nothing to see in here, but that's because everything is over in the Azure OpenAI Studio. So the model deployments look like this. So as I mentioned earlier, the service itself has groupings of models underneath that that have got specific use cases. Um, we've got a GPT-4 model here. Uh, so... Uh, this is the very, almost the very latest. Actually, we've got GPT-4 Turbo, but uh, GPT-4 is good enough for what we need to do here. Uh, and then there's a, a text DaVinci model here, which we we'll, won't be using. Then there's this text embedding ARDA-2 model here, uh, which we will be using. Uh, and then some GPT-3.5 uh, and some GPT-4 models with larger token limits. But again, we don't need to worry too much about them. We'll be concentrating on GPT-4 and the embedding models. And what's nice about this portal interface is that we can actually leap in to these models and start playing with them in the portal. So when you do that, you end up in the chat playground here. So this here is a basic chat interface, which you'll have seen before, at least the middle part of this. Uh, but what we get on top of that is we get the ability to be able to set the assistant up. And I'll come back to this to describe what that means from both a um, how am I supposed to act point of view 
as well as um, a configuration for how many messages we include and parameters like the maximum response and the temperature, which is you know how randomized the responses are and things like that. Uh, but we don't need to worry too much about that for now, but we can interact directly with this um, uh, GPT-4 model just here. So we can say, what is Microsoft's, oh, if I can spell, mission? And hit that, and then all being well, we get a response. So Microsoft's mission is to empower every person, every organization on the planet to achieve more. So this is a, a nice place that you can start and just make sure that your model's doing what you want. And then you can start fine tuning it using these configurations uh, on the right hand side, which is which is quite nice. So we've seen how it works here in the uh, in the playground, but of course we want to program against that. So what I've got here is a Blazor .NET 8 Blazor application that I've created, and we'll be using this for most of the demos, um, uh, the portal either the portal or this application here. So. You won't be able to get to this. You can have a look, but you'll need to log in and uh, ask me to add uh, add you to my Active Directory. And uh, I'm not going to do that because um, I'm not crazy enough to give free access to GPT-4 for everybody. That would be a, a crazy thing to do. So um, this is all locked down. Sorry. But either way, um, what we've got is a landing page here, which just explains a little bit about the application itself and how to reach me and all of this code is on GitHub and I'll give the links in the slide in the slides right at the very end so you can go check that out if you like. Uh, but we've got three pages here and the first of them really is the chat page and this is very similar to what we saw with the chat playground. It's just that we don't get all of the control around the edge. So we can do a very similar thing here. So what is OpenAI for instance? And then we get a response back from OpenAI. So this is using the SDK. Um, and we can do other things as well. So we can have write me a simple HTML page. And uh, I've added a little bit of code here, so it'll give you the markup there that you can copy, similar to what you get in the in the standard uh, Ch chat GPT interface that you'll be used to seeing. So um, it's, it's not particularly complicated, and we can have a look at the code to see how most of that's working. Um, shout if in the chat if the code's too small, you can't see it, but I think I've zoomed in far enough um, for folks to be able to make most of this out. So we've got the markup for the site here. Now I'm using something called Mud Blazer. Um, and if you've used Blazer before and you've not used Mud Blazer, go and check it out. Um, I'm not sponsored by them, not um, related to them in any way, but they're that they've got a fantastic set of free user controls for for Blazer to be able to embed in your applications. It's it's really good and can't can't big them up enough. Uh, but yeah, at the top here, I'm not going to dive too much into this because you saw what it was, but we've got really we've got a uh, a chat interface there with a um, the list of chat bubble messages at the top and then the the input at the bottom. The interesting part comes in the code down below. Now, there are a bunch of different ways to make a chat application. And if you've been around a while and you've made chat applications in the past, you'll have used WebSockets. And that's what I've based this on. We could do this with just an API if we wanted to, but I like SignalR. And if you know anything about Blazor, actually, uh, Blazor bakes in SignalR um, because at least the Blazor server model, they use SignalR to be able to coordinate the DOM changes between the part of the uh, that's it's based on in Azure, for instance, and then the part that runs in the browser. Uh, those those DOM changes are sent down from the hosted part and the uh, the interactions are sent back up. So SignalR and Blazor tend to go hand in hand. Also, I work quite heavily with Blazor. Uh, so you'll see in any other talk that I do, you'll often see SignalR mentioned in that. So I like that. But it gives us some, some flexibility in keeping the UX nice and clean, separation of concerns, but also makes things nice and reactive. So this top part here really is about hooking up to um, the SignalR chat hub in the cloud um, and then hooking up to receive um, method calls back from the cloud. So we can send information over SignalR and the SignalR uh, service can send information back. Now, this first method uh, handler here, this receive message, actually we don't use. Now, if we didn't use SignalR and we just used a plain API as it was without any streaming or anything, we'd get a block response back 
from signal r just in one go and if that was quite long you know three four paragraphs it would just look like nothing's happening and then we'd get all of the response back but i, I didn't particularly like that so what we do is we we get it token by token now tokens you could think of are like words maybe but they're not quite they're more mathematical than that but for the purposes of this talk if you just imagine a word as a token so each response we get back from um, from the open ai service will be a an individual token we stream it back and then we can put that onto the screen and that's what this part's here here's doing so it just takes that and it just updates the chat message with that latest version of the text so not too complicated that part there's no point diving mega deep into how it's really working but i can explain at least the blocks uh, and then down here we send the query so again we're going to be using signal r to do that um which we're doing just here but we we grab the particular uh, chat message that we're interacting with and we send the query over signal r using send query and then that lands over on the server and it's able to be processed i'll dig in to how the chat hub's working a little bit later on uh, but that's the code on the front end. So you see it keeps the front end nice and lean. So there's not actually any open AI work being done in this front end side at all. The other good thing about not interacting directly with open AI from the front end is we're not exposing our key. So an API key and, a, uh, and an endpoint out in the open would be bad. There are other ways to authenticate with open AI as well, but uh, this way we keep that nice and locked down. So all of the open AI interactions are just done on the back end. And that is done over on the server side. So I mentioned those different ways of, of hosting Blazor. We've got WebAssembly and then we've got uh, Blazor server, which is all on the, the server side. WebAssembly is all in the browser. And then we've got hosted Blazor server, uh, which kind of combines those two things together. So we get a back end service uh, running as well as the front end WebAssembly side. So this open AI help is now running up on the server. Now, um, there's a, a few bits of code in here, but I'm not going to dive too deep into a lot of it at this point. The only part we need to worry about for now is this query open AI with prompts. Now, there's building blocks in here. The code's actually quite simple. The, the first block is just grabbing the keys and deployment names from uh, the secret store. Uh, again, we don't want them in the code. We don't want to have to check them into our GitHub repo and then for somebody to go steal our OpenAI uh, key. That would be a bad idea. Uh, then we we just generate a, a GUID for the, uh, the response message that we're going to be sending back so we can keep that one up to date. Then we create the OpenAI client here and we pass in those credentials we created above um, so that we can open that API link to open ai essentially then we need to configure how we want the chat to um uh, to work the interaction that it wants to to be based upon now if you remember in the portal we saw in the playground that we get this assistant setup and configuration of uh, these configure those same settings so we've got the temperature and the maximum number of ta uh, tokens and then things like nucleus sampling factor and frequency penalties and presence penalties, which we won't go into, but this really sort of forces it to behave in a certain way, not repeat itself and cut off words and things like that. Uh, but we also pass in a couple of messages. And the first one is this system message. Uh, and that's the same as what you can see here, system message. Uh, and the second one is our prompt, our query that we're sending to it. And then once we do that, we could, if we wanted to, um, skip some previous messages so we can make a conversational style interaction here and include those previous messages for it to be able to ref refer to. Or you could make it just a single shot, as it's called, where you have a, a question and response type um, interaction and it doesn't conversationalize it. There are reasons for both of those, and we'll talk about them in a, in a little bit. Uh, so that's what this section is doing, is dealing with those previous messages. Uh, and then at the end, we just add back in our original prompt, and that just reinforces um, that whole interaction to make sure that that context, as it's called, your query is is front and center. Uh, and then at that point, we call the OpenAI endpoint and ask it to go ahead and, and give us the response. It can give us more than one response, more than one completion, as it's called, uh, which is what this loop's doing, but we're only ever going to get one the way we've we've configured it. Uh, and you'll see as well, it's using the word streaming. 
So you can either, as I mentioned before, query OpenAI and get a block response, if that's how you want to work, or you can get this streaming token by token response, which gives you a far better um, user experience. So well worth doing. Uh, and then what we do is we just add the latest bit of that token to our overall completion, which we're not actually spending much time using because what we do is we create a queue and we add that um, uh, content uh, update to that queue. Now, the reason why I'm doing this is that those tokens can come back as maybe six tokens and one token and 12 tokens and three tokens. So when it appears on the screen, it, it's all lumpy and it doesn't look very nice. So I've added a queue to this and what it does, it regularly pulls off a word at a time and it gives you that kind of teletype typewriter based um, response that you saw on the screen rather than big blocks appearing here and there. It makes it look a bit silly, really. Uh, so you'll see down at the bottom, I'll skip all of this code, that we process the queue down here. Uh, and that just runs on a timer. So every second or so, it'll just go through, process the latest bits of the message, and then it sends it out using that receive message token that up here, receive message token, is received on the front end. So although there was, there was a fair amount of code there, actually, it's, it's mostly blocked up. Uh, there's more code down below, but we'll come back to that in a little minute. But you know, we've got, you know, grab the keys uh, and then... Um, we just tell it that we've got this holding message here, so that goes to the front end to give you that dot, dot, dot. Create the client for OpenAI. Tell it how we want it to perform, including the messages that we want it to work on. Include any previous messages. And then make sure that we, we re-add our prompt at the end and then ask it for the response and send it back to the front end. So... Again, there's a fair few lines of code, but those blocks are actually pretty simple and you'd expect to do those things. So um, hopefully that makes a fair amount of sense. So if we go back to the slides now, I told you I've got like four virtual desktops and loads of windows open. So switching to the next slide. We live in a, a world of unstructured data as we were talking about earlier, and this includes text and images and video and audio. And AI models are trained on this corpus of data across the internet. And what that does, it, it makes them powerful prediction engines. If, if you don't quite know uh, how these models work, they're really just prediction engines. So they, they grab a token and then they grab another token and another token and another token until they make a response. And they use decision trees to do that. Uh, highly mathematical stuff, way out of my reach. Uh, but really, they don't know what they're saying. Not really. They just know they follow a path to get to a response. And that's based on all of that training data across the Internet. But again, it doesn't have our own data as part of that model. So we need a way to be able to fix that problem. And one way to do it is to use something called retrieval augmented generation or RAG, as it's often referred to. And this is a way that we can bring our own data to the power of these LLMs. Now, we store our data in some form of a database, and that database allows us to use the same query that the user's given to be able to then get the res results out of that database that are related to that query directly. And I'll go into this in a bit more detail. But once we've got those query results, we then combine it with that uh, original prompt. So we've got a bunch of results from a database and our prompt. And then we give that to the model and ask it to look at those sources of data and our prompt and make some sort of a response for us. And we can actually see this working in, in the portal if we wanted to. So if we switch back across the portal, I mentioned earlier we've got this system message area. Uh, and that could be something like uh, talk like a pirate, which is always funny. And then if I save that and say... Uh, what is OpenAI? Then in theory, we should get a pirate response when it uh, starts talking back to me. OpenAI would be mighty artificial intelligence. I like doing that. I like uh, talk like a pirate. That's always funny. Uh, but uh, the point being is that we can put whatever we like into that system message and it will behave in that way. And it, it prioritizes that data that goes into that system message. So uh, we could say, you know, you uh, are a helpful 
AI assistant still that was there before. But we can also say, use the following data to answer my questions. And what I've done is using ChatGPT, of all things, I've generated some um, bogus accounts for a company called XYZ Retail. So you can see we've got um, a whole heap of accounts here at the top, and then we've got an exec executive summary at the bottom, which is kind of like what you'd get for, for regular accounts. And it, it goes on and talks about a financial overview and balance sheet highlights and, you know, who's the CEO and CTO and stuff like that. Now, what we can do in the portal is we can control A and control C, all of that data. And then if we go back to the portal, we can just paste it into this system message prompt. And you see now I've got all of that contents of that PDF in that system prompt now. And I can apply those changes and press continue to that. And now I can say, who is the CEO of XYZ Retail? And it says the CEO of XYZ Retail is Jane Anderson. And you know, going back across to the, uh, the data there, we can scroll through until we get to that. And the CEO is Jane Anderson. So what we've done there is given it the context to be able to answer questions based on our own data, which is nice, not the most user-friendly way of trying to interact with OpenAI with your own data, but it does work. And the other thing that you'll see in deployment is that we've started to use some of our tokens up. So down here, we've it's a bit small, but that says we've used 1,243 of our 8,000 tokens. So imagine if this document was, you know, five times bigger, we just couldn't fit it in there. It just wouldn't give us the ability to fit it in there. So we're going to need to figure out a better way of doing that, uh, which I'll come back to in a little bit. But back to our application we've got here, I've implemented that um, AI search mechanism in here as well. So we've got different uh, search types, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and we can we can search in these results here. But before we do that, let's, let's kind of explain how the, the search element's working uh, using the slides first, and we'll come back to the application. Boink, there we go. So a little bit more about retrieval augmented generation. What we do is we ingest our own data uh, into some form of a, a database. But before we can do that, we need to break it up into smaller parts. And this is called chunking. Um, and there are a load of different mechanisms for, for chunking, for breaking our data up. But if you imagine you just take maybe a page of your data at a time, and then you store that data in a database. And then what you do is retrieve that using queries. Now, none of this sounds particularly complicated. We could do this with SQL Server if we wanted to. Uh, but you'll see there are better ways of doing that. And one of them is to use something called AI search. Now, there are a whole heap of different uh, mechanisms for, for storing data this way. And AI search is, is the one that I've chosen for this because it's the, the Microsoft search service recommended for this. And that service is a, is a cloud-based search-driven uh, database that allows us to be able to query over our own data in a number of different ways. We can query as text or use fuzzy searching or proximity searching or something called vector searching, which is super important. Um, and we'll come back to it in a bit. I'm planting seeds of information in your head here that we're going to embellish in a minute. And like any good Azure service, we get a multi-language multi SDK with that. So either Python, C Sharp, JavaScript, anything you like, or probably not Haskell or Fortran, but you know, most of the major languages are going to be supported. And again, it's going to shortcut our uh, journey into using these services. Something that's quite important to bed down is something called indexes. So when we start using these sorts of databases uh, that are, uh, you know, generally for, for LLM applications, we'll have indexes in there rather than tables, but indexes really are tables in a database. So the service itself, you can imagine, is the database and an index would be a table within that database. And like a database table, uh, we get schemas and fields to go along with that, how we define how the data is stored in each of those indexes. And we get some extra benefits that we can turn on and off where we can set fields to be filterable so we can pass in a query and but we can also filter those results that come back based on certain criteria 
and we also get something called facets and until i started looking at um uh, these sorts of databases i didn't actually know what facets were but they're the ability to be able to grab all of the options out of a particular field for a result set and use it to fill things like drop downs or check boxes to be able to filter your data on the next query quite useful actually uh, and then of course like any good database we have a way of querying it um, but the good thing about ai search is we've got a few different ways of doing that and we'll end up combining them actually where we've got full text search which is kind of like control f or just select uh, in a database where we're just going to search for specific words and it's going to give us uh, a result based on those words but it's pretty prescriptive at that point unless you start looking at fuzzy search it's not really going to know anything about the meaning of what you're searching for so to do that we can use something called vector search now again ai search is a, a vector database store one of many uh, quadrant wev8 feist there's quite a few of those available um, and what vectors are, are a mathematical way to be able to represent the meaning of uh, an item of uh, text or image or sound or anything like that. And I'll explain what vectors are in the slides coming up, and then all of this will start making sense. So we've got full text search and vector search, two different ways of searching. Uh, but to improve our searching mechanisms, we can actually do something called a hybrid search, which does this vector search, this mathematical search first. And it combines it then with the full text search to really limit down uh, that result set and make sure that it, it's pretty much exactly what you're looking for. And then on top of that, we can do something called semantic re-ranking. Uh, this used to be called semantic search, but they renamed it quite rightly to semantic re-ranker because semantic search doesn't do a search. What it does is it takes your set of results and then it applies an AI model over the top of that with your query to try and figure out and reorganize those results into a result set prioritized with exactly what you're looking for. Sadly, it's a paid service above a certain uh, threshold of data. I think it's about 50 meg. It's not very much. Uh, and it's about 200 pounds a month the last time I looked, so not cheap. But even on small sets of data I've seen, and you'll see when I demo it later, it does have quite a big effect on, uh, on the, the quality of those results. So well worth looking at. So let's look at AI search. So like the other demos, let's start in the portal. So the overview page of uh, AI search doesn't look like much again. So a little bit like the open AI uh, overview page, the landing page, we get an essential section at the top and uh, our details and some helpful links at the bottom. We do get um, our keys. And again, we're going to need these just like we did with OpenAI to be able to interact with this, uh, where we get these admin keys and query keys. Now, if you just want to query, that's what the query key is for. If you want to create indexes, which is what we're doing in this application, uh, so indexes tables, if you remember, uh, then you'll need an admin key to be able to do that. So that's what these two sets of keys are doing. Uh, and then we get an indexes page. Uh, and we've only got one index and we've only got three documents, three items in that. Uh, and we can actually have a look at what this looks like in the portal as well. So skipping ahead of Search Explorer, we'll go back to that. This is the schema of our index. So again, indexes, think tables, where we get the field name and the type. And I've been lazy and just made everything a string. Uh, but you see, you can select whether they're retrievable or not. So you can store them and search through them, but they wouldn't necessarily always come back in the result set. Uh, and then we can filter on them. Again, we do the search and we only filter bringing back certain sets of results based on the criteria. Then we can sort on them. And then there's this facetable uh, selector here. So I've got company and year selected, and you'll see those popping up in my UI. Uh, and then searchable as well. So can we actually process parts of those as part of the search. Then at the bottom, we've got two extra um, uh, fields down here um, labeled vector, title, and content. And you'll see that there's a dimension 1536. Uh, and this is all about vectors. And again, the next slide you see will be uh, talking about vectors. I've teased them long enough, uh, but actually it's a subject on its own. So I wanted to give it enough time, but I wanted you to see why and where these, these were coming from.
so that's that's kind of what it looks like but we can actually just like open ai we can have a play with this in here so we can say search for where we've got new retail locations in our documents now i've uploaded that same pdf of xyz retails accounts to this index just the 2021 year and if i search through that then you'll see i get some results i get quite a lot of results and you'll see oh mostly numbers that's actually vectors that's a vectorized version of that content and you'll see what that means when i explain it in the next slide but that could be a bit overawing and we don't necessarily always want that so we can actually interact with this query from the json view and we can ask it to dial that down and again it's a database so we can add a select statement Woohoo! we know select nearly all of us have done that um so we just want content and year here so we do that search again and now you see we've got a far more manageable uh, set of data back um not very much data uh, but we've got a set of options and we get a score back and the re-ranker because this is that semantic search so uh, it's telling me that it's positioned this at 2.2 and that one at 2.2 there, look, rather. Uh, but we have got our text, uh, new store expansion plans, planning to open two new store locations and then some more. As we expand our reach through the new store locations, so you can see that that search that uh, we applied there, the new retail locations, has brought back some results, which is nice. So let's see what that looks like in the application. Remember I mentioned we've got those different search types. We've got vector search, which is that basic mathematical search, hybrid search and semantic hybrid search in there. And we can do our search in there. So uh, XYZ's uh, net income in 2021, and we get some results, which looks nice. I like the look of that. So that works quite nicely. So um, let's go back to the slides let me explain vectors because as i say i've i've teased you with what vectors are for long enough so just searching in a traditional database with a select statement even with stars around it you're going to get the words you search for and it's not necessarily very useful so we need a way to be able to search for the semantic meaning of what you're searching for um so one way we do that is to use something called vectors. And what it does is it converts this unstructured data, um, text or images or, or sound or video or anything like that, into a set of numbers using the model that um, we're going to be doing. It uses an AI model, the ARDA model, and it creates 1,536 of these um, vectors. And they're points in space, and you'll understand what that means in a minute. And then what we do is we store them in something called a vector database. And again, we could use something called Quadrant or Weaviate or Vice, uh, but we're using um, Azure AI Search here to store those vectors. And vector databases are really good at being able to then take a vector as a search query and find similar vectors using a whole heap of maths cosine analysis is what it's actually doing under the hood. And again, that's way over my head. I'm not a data scientist. But essentially, it's comparing these two sets of vectors and giving us things that are quite close, semantically speaking. So what do I mean by that? So imagine we've got the vector representation of the word car, and that is the top section of that actual vector with a whole heap of numbers, minuses and pluses. Um, and then if you take the vector representation of the word lorry, what it does is it combines those two uh, to find out how far away that the meaning of those two um, searches are. So it's using an AI model to understand what the word car means and an AI model to understand what the word lorry means. And if if you imagine now, this isn't what it's doing, but conceptually speaking, if you imagine that top left number is like has wheels. It could be that those two numbers are quite close together because car and lorry has wheels. Now, if you were doing, say, a fuzzy search, a regular fuzzy search, and you did car and cat, they'd come back quite closely together, but they're nothing like each other. So it kind of highlights the difference in doing a, a fuzzy search and a vector search in that it understands the meaning of what it is that you're you're trying to use here. Now, another way to explain that is, and if you've ever watched any uh, discussions about vector search and vector comparisons, then you'll have heard of the king queen model for explaining this. Now, we start with a king, so the vector representation of the word king. 
uh, all of those 1536 numbers. And if we take the vector representation of man away from that vector representation of king and then add in the vector representation of a woman, guess what we get? We get a queen. And this is the vector version of a queen. You, 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 you have a look, convert that vector back into a word, if you will, and you'll get queen as, as a result. And this is this powerful maths is what allows us to be able to do super searches with not just single words, but whole phrases. And they're even better, to be fair. The more context you can give it, the more understanding it has of what it is you're trying to search for. Just to do that again, we've got a king and we take away the man, which leaves just the crown element, if you will. And then we add in a woman and then we get a queen as a response to that. One more way of looking at this, in case that wasn't enough, is uh, there's something called TensorBoard, which is a Google um, uh, platform that you can go and play with uh, things like vectors in 3D space. So it'll visualize vectors in 3D space. It's dead good. So I've recorded this little video of what that looks like. So what you're looking at here is actually um, a bunch of metadata from reviews on IMDb of movies. So you'll see words in there like Powell and suggest and meet and greet and so it's not the full word it's tokenized but if i scroll this across a little bit so across to here and then what we can do is we can filter these words with that uh, panel on the right so if i put delight in there so this is a positive word and you'll see if i move this around you'll see some of the words in there and i'll hover over them uh, in just a second but it's grouping those positive words together in 3d space we can sort of see all of these positive words. So we've got things like definitely and perfect um, and beautiful. Like Maria Anastasia's slides, I think, is probably what it's describing, to be fair. Refreshing. All of those things. So if I scroll this to the side, though, and we go for something which isn't positive. So if I put terrible in here, there we are. And you'll see those words have gone to the left. And search for that. It's moved all of those meanings to the left hand side and they're nowhere near the positives. So you can see, see things like horrible and stupid and boring and poor. And it just allows us to be able to understand sort of mathematically speaking, a, a visualized way of, of how those vectors differ. So although they might just look like the matrix um, uh, on the screen, as far as meaning, semantic meaning is concerned, it allows us to be able to figure out what it is what, what's the, the concept underneath what it is you're searching for? So um, with that in mind, um, we can have a look at the code uh, of what I've created for the search page. So again, we saw how this works. We've got a search type at the top and we can do different search types. We've not got enough data in there at the moment to demo this, but um, I will demo that shortly. Um, we can search, get the results back. So it's pretty simple. And so is the code, really, to be fair. So let's close up these ones. We don't need them anymore. And what we do want is our uh, AI search page to see. So we've got the markup at the top. Again, no point diving too deep into that. We've got you know the search results and the, the query box underneath it. Yet again, we've got um, our signal R uh, connections here. And the only thing it's doing is receiving those results back. Again. I probably could have done this with an API if I wanted to and cut a lot of this out, but SignalR is already set up, so we might as well just use it. So that's what that's going to do here. Uh, and then uh, onwards from that, we send the query and then that disappears off out to the back end. So not nothing much more to see in the front end. Again, keeps it nice and lean, not much code in there. And most of the code then is over here in the cognitive search helper page. Now, there's quite a lot of code, and I'll come back to this in a little bit, uh, to some of it. So I'm going to scroll through past a lot of this at the top. I'll come back to that. Don't worry. The parts we're interested here is the single vector search. So in order to um, compare our query to the vectors in the database, we need to convert our query into a vector. So that's what this is doing here. So uh, embeddings are the vector essentially that's those lists of numbers as an embedding uh, so same sort of thing so we pass in our query to that and we get those 1536 numbers back out again uh, and then we create some search options and the query is passed in here so it's a vectorized query 
we pass that in we tell it how many we'd like back uh, and what fields we need to compare that against and we're just going to compare that against that content vector uh, and then we tell it we just want a simple query for this so this is just doing a really simple uh, vector search here and we tell it we'd like the title content company location file name and year so all of that back but we don't actually ask for the, the vector back just like i did in the portal there uh, and then we can take in some filters if we like uh, you'll see those on the next page uh, and then at that point we just send the query to the search client and we get a bunch of these search documents back which are json essentially and here all i'm doing is taking those search documents and converting them into a concrete class uh, there's probably a few different ways I could have done this, but I wanted it to look a relatively simple piece of code. So I'm literally just storing those in, in our class, debugging it out. Uh, and then if we wanted to, we can actually filter by the score here. I showed you that score and we could say that we want to cut off because we don't like some of those results because they fall outside of the, the, the bounds of our uh, context there. We're not interested in it, uh, but actually i'm just going to give the whole cognitive search uh, result set back so everything we get back uh, and then we've got these other types of search that i mentioned where we can combine full text search and vector so there's not much code difference here it's not very dry um the main difference actually is the fact that we pass in the query so you'll see up here when we're beginning that we just pass null in here but in the uh, the hybrid search we pass in the query to um the, the client and then it combines that vector search with the full text search and you know, sort of just refocuses what it's trying to search for uh, and then we've got the semantic hybrid search so this is layering that semantic re-ranker on the top and again the code's not that much different but we tell it that we use that semantic search and we need to tell it which one we've used uh, because there's a good chance that you might have more than one. So you have pointed at the service that, that you've uh, stood up for this particular um, for this particular demo or particular use case. Uh, and then again, same select, uh, same query and search options, and off it goes and gives you the results, and then we can uh, return those back. So not much here to worry about either. It's It's pretty much just querying open AI, uh, querying uh, AI search and giving us a result set back and feeding that to the front end. So relatively scant code really, although again, lots of lines, but the blocks are pretty simple. So back to the slides and we'll talk a little bit more about how we use re uh, resource uh, retrieval assisted generation, re retrieval augmented generation in our applications. So. I like a good animation in a set of slides. So we start with a front end of some sort and we hook that up to an API backend using whatever you like, SignalR in our case. And then that API has got access to uh, AI search and also OpenAI. What we do is a user comes along and uploads a PDF and that goes through the front end and up to the API at the back end. Now, I mentioned previously that what we need to do is break that PDF or whatever document down into smaller parts, chunks, because it could be too big. And if we don't do that, you know that with um, uh, a, a large language model, as I showed in the portal there, we've got a limited number of tokens. So the question can only be so big and we're going to run out of space if we try and upload a large document. So we need to break it down or chunk it. So we send that to open AI in chunks and get it to create this vectorized embedded set of numbers that we're able to then store in our vector database in AI search so that later on when a user comes and says I want to start performing a query that query can be sent to the API and then we need to convert that query into a vector so that we can compare these two vectors using AI search to get a set of results back I'll go back through this in a bit, so don't worry about taking too much of it in now, but the theory at least you'll see in a minute. And then what we do is we take that original query that the user sent from the left hand side and combine the query and the results. And we send those out to OpenAI and say, hey, here's your results and they're not vectorized results. This is plain text now we're sending. Tell us, just like you saw in the portal where I was copying and pasting code in, uh, uh, documents in rather, and asking it to 
to query based on that information. We pass in our query and our result set and OpenAI gives us that set of results back. And we, what we do is we give then as well those original search results back. Now, this is important because with any AI interaction, you always need to make sure that you're checking your sources of data. So if you're going to build a, a system like this, always return the sources that you're using to contextualize that query so that the user can make their minds up as to whether or not that is a good source of data. Now, you'll see this if you use something like Bing Chat. Uh, you'll see that there'll be citations at the bottom and it'll actually tell you where it's got its information from. And that's super important because we shouldn't trust it. We shouldn't just let it be the pilot. These things are co-pilots, essentially. They're, they're helping you uh, make your decisions better. So you, you can't just willy-nilly use it. Um, make sure you check your data. So let's see how that all works in our uh, front end. And this is the part that you kind of really came to see was... Um, how is how uh, we can actually take our own data? So we've got this open AI and AI search page. Now, what this is doing really is combining those two previous chat and AI search pages together into our full application now. Now at the top, we can actually upload some more documents if we want to. And then we've got filters. Now I mentioned that we've got um, filters and facets. So these are the filters and the facets are the way that we fill this filter in so that we can filter by a specific company if I had more than one company's uh, data. Uh, and also we've got the year. Now I've only uploaded one year's worth of data, so that's why I've only got one year in there. Uh, and then we've got the options. Again, if you wanted to have a conversational style interaction with your system, then we include the previous messages into that context. But if you wanted to make sure that you gave as much context regarding your documents as possible and you weren't bothered about that previous history, then you could turn that off, for instance, and only just do one shot question and answer based on those uh, document results. It really depends on on how you want to interact with your model. But we'll leave that on. But in here, for instance, now we could say, what was XYZ Retail's net income in 2021? And if I zoom out a little bit, just give us a bit more space. You'll see on the left, it's very similar to what we saw in the portal here. But we've got the response XYZ Retail's income in 2021 was 90,000. And that's telling me that it was DOC1 um, 2021 annual report, which is this report here. Uh, and in all of this horrible looking data, because it's just converted it to plain text and I've not done any processing with it, uh, we'll find that it will say that that net income is 90,000, but we've actually given it all three of these sources. And it's up to you just to make sure that you're happy with that, because, you know, if you're a solicitor, you can't just trust this and copy and paste it. Although that's exactly what some people have done and lost their jobs. Um, terrible idea. So um, again, that that's relatively simple. There's not much to that. You know, it's, it's a combination of those two previous pages. Now, what you'll see, which is interesting in here, is that these are all 2021 results. But if I upload the 2022 document, 2022 on your report, and you'll see the signal R at work here. So this is keeping this all up to date with what it's actually doing, which is why I like it over an API. Um, although that was quite quick. If you've got lots of documents, that kind of keeps that all up to date. Now, if I refresh this page, bum, bum, bum. There we go. And if we go to our filters now, you'll see I've got two years, still one company, X, Y, Z, but I've got two years worth of data. Now, let's ask that question again in 2021 here. Now, we've got 2021, 2021, but now we've got 2022 results appearing in here as well as 2021. Now, the only difference between 2021 and 2022 is a single digit. And semantically, they're quite close together. So when you're doing that vector search, this is where it kind of falls down on keywords because it's not really spotted that uh, 2021 and 2022 are different. But this is where things like semantic search actually do make a difference. So that, that has helped, believe it or not. If I go to just the AI search page and we do what was uh, XYZ's retail in, in 2022, for instance, we get 2022 and then 2021, 2021, 2022, 2022, and 2022. So these top three results, two of them are the wrong year, which isn't great. And if we do a hybrid search, so this is doing the vector search with this query, 
and then taking that same query and doing the full text and adding it to it. If we add that, then you'll see, although we still get those results, kind of one of those 2021 results has disappeared, although two of them are still in the top 10 here. Still not great. But if we do a semantic hybrid search, then now we've got 2022, 2022, 2022, 2022, 2022, and 2021 has appeared right at the bottom of that list now. So you can see the power of that that semantic re-ranker on top of that is that it's actually understood that there's a semantic difference between 2022 and 2021. So more powerful than just the vector search and the, the control F um, hybrid along with it, adding that semantic re-ranker has had a meaningful result just to our small data set. So it's well worth using um, uh, to make sure that you get the right set of data and you know prioritize the top three or whatever rather than the top 10 like I've done here or top eight, uh, top six in that case. Um, and then you'll only get the data that you want in your context. So super important. So let's finish off. We'll have a look at the code for that. I'll zoom through that quite quickly. So um, if we go to the... Um, open AI AI search page. Um, there's not much to see in here. So there's the, the markup at the top, but we saw what that looked like. So we've got um, upload area, filter area, and include the previous messages, and then the, the message response area, the sources, and the uh, query input. So that's what all that is. And then we get all of the signal R and uh, stuff set up at the top here. Uh, our hub connection and then receiving a message token, just like we did in the chat page. Cognitive search results, just like we saw in the AI search results page. But we also get the facets back. If you remember those, um, that's the, the list of options we've got in those filters. Um, and then that's really it. Um, we've got some stuff for the status for the upload um, in there as well. Uh, and then we can get the filters here if we wanted to. And then we send that query. And then that goes off to the uh, the chat hub, and then the chat hub deals with with doing that. And then that's that's it. We upload our files and and piece those together. So before we we go much further, if we just show you the chat hub uh, over in the server here. So this is where all of the signal R uh, interaction goes through. But we've got this send cog search query here, uh, which is the one which uh, deals with just doing the um, uh, the interaction on that page we've just seen. So we get those search results, and then using the OpenAI service, we query with those prompts and sources. So we can have a quick look at um, what that's doing on that page with the prompts and sources uh, in our OpenAI helper. So query with prompts and sources just here. I could have done F12, but I wanted you to see where that was. Uh, so we've got some extra prompting that we're doing here just to make sure that the the system knows how it's interacting correctly so i'm telling it that it's it's by me it's an expert in supplied documents and it's it allows you to gain insights uh, from the documents and i'm telling it what we're going to do we're going to give it a question and extracted part of some documents and i'm expecting you to provide a clear and structured answer and return any tables at html and where relevant use bullet points uh, and then what we do is then we add on the sources here. So when relevant, use facts and figures from the following sources, just like I did in the portal you saw. Um, but other things like if no documents are provided, then don't add a reference. And if no relevant information is there, then tell me that there's no relevant information. It needs to know these things. You need to tell the system prompt. And th this is all prompt engineering, if you've heard of that. And this is the part that you'll have to fine tune based on your data and the way you want it to interact with it. So important that you know where that's done. Uh, and then we grab those uh, cognitive search results and we add them onto that sources prompt. Uh, and then we send the query using the same um, methodology we had before. So create the options for how the query wants to be done, include any previous messages, uh, add on our original query at the end just to make sure the context is captured and get the results and send them back. So relatively straightforward from that point of view. The other thing I wanted to show you though is in the cognitive search helper. When I uploaded that document, it did a few different things. And it, it called into this create or update an index. So 
I mentioned right at the very start when I showed you the cognitive, the AI search portal page, the keys, where we had the admin key and the query key. We're using the admin key because we're able to create the index here, the table, if you will. So we create an index and we actually do that using this compose index just here. And um, what we do is we need to tell it the profiles it's going to use. So the vector search profile. So in other words, how are you going to vectorize or unvectorize this data? So which model are you going to use? And also then uh, which algorithm do you want to use to create that? It uses something called HNSW, which is high, high, um, hierarchical navigable small worlds is what that stands for. And actually it's it's um, it works a little bit like if you imagine Google Maps or, you know, whatever, Bing Maps, and you're looking for a lake and you zoomed right out and you kind of spot something that looks a little bit like a lake and you zoom in a bit more and, oh, yeah, there's three lakes there, but that one looks like the right one and we zoom in a bit more and, oh, yeah, we can see the outline of it there and zoom in a bit more. That's what this vectorized searching is doing. It's kind of navigating its way down these different layers to be able to compare these vectors together. It's quite clever, lots of data science, but that's the the, the top level of how that works. Uh, and then we tell it how how to use the semantic search. Again, we need to tell it which field it's going to use to compare those vectors. For hours, we use the content um, here. Uh, and then we create the index, the schema of the index. So whether it's a key, whether it's filterable and sortable and facetable. Uh, and then we create those vector columns in there, those vector fields, um, and tell it to use a cert, uh, the vector search profile name uh, to be able to store that and the model dimensions that 1536 again um, and then when we're uploading documents we can process each of those extractions and store them in the database um, with that schema so file name location title and search documents and we add them to that and then we send that results back so that's probably all the code that you need to see for that again all the code is on github you can you can grab that to your heart's content uh, and play with that. So you saw the application. So just to recap on uh, retrieval augmented generation, because it's worthwhile um, just going over that because there's a fair amount of concepts. Again, what we've got is a front end application, our Blazor application that you saw there. And we connect that to an API, a back end API. And that has access to Azure AI Search and OpenAI. And in the first instance, somebody comes along with a PDF and they upload that to the backend API. We split that um, document up into bits and then create embeddings from them, uh, as you saw there. And those embeddings are then stored in Azure AI Search for querying later. So a user comes along and performs a query through the front end. That query is processed then by the API by sending it to AI search and creating that same vector embedding for, for comparison by the AI search service, which gives us a set of results back. Again, these are plain text results that we can read. You saw them in the, in the uh, application there. We then combine that query and result set together with prompts, as you saw, telling it that it's an expert in you know, processing documents and here's some documents and use those as your source of data. Combine that together through the API and send that to OpenAI, and it gives you a result back that you can give to the user. So there all them tokens that are appearing. And to allow the user cont to contextualize that response, we give them the set of results back for, it, for them to check as well. And that's really it. So again, if you want the source code, then the web app source code is all there. Um, you don't need to worry too much about taking this down because there's a QR code on the next page if you want it and a bit.ly to get to these slides where you'll find all of this information. Uh, if you want to learn a little bit more about Azure's OpenAI, then you can do that on that bit.ly. And likewise, the AI search uh, service is there. And also there's uh, uh, an article there on retrieval augmented generation from Microsoft. It's well worth checking out. Also, some of the explanations that uh, you saw about vectors and comparisons. Um, I learned from watching a couple of computer file um, videos. I really must add those to these list of uh, links, actually. So go and search a computer file vectors, and there's a couple of awesome search um, uh, vector search and vector comparison videos there that explain a lot of the concepts that I've been talking about in detail.
Um, and then um, from and contact me, Twitter X, as it is now, is the best place to get me. So that's at Pete underscore codes. Um, so you can you can grab me on there whenever you like. Um, I've got a blog as well, so uh, mostly IoT stuff, uh, but you'll find a plethora of different blog posts on my website, petecoes.co.uk, or you can email me at peter at pjgcreations.co.uk. And there's a QR code or the bit.ly to the slides, PJG Open AI Supercharged Slides, uh, and that will contain all of the, these links in it anyway. So thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. That was excellent. Thank you. There's a lot of content in there, and I've been told it could be three talks uh, if I was to split it all up into three separate pieces. Um, but I try and break it down at least uh, so that it's manageable and and folks can consume that um, without getting overwhelmed. But I mean, if you've got any questions, then then fire away. Um, by all means, I'm not a data scientist, but I'll try and answer whatever you've got there. Um, oh, actually, tell you what, I didn't show you. Let me just share my screen again. Uh, da, 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 da. Hey, look. So if I go back to my demo, if it lets me, if I go back to chat, if I go, watch this. We get clippy mode. Woohoo! I can zoom in a little bit. It's actually clippy, and it, now it's in clippy mode. So, uh, what was XYZ's retail in 2022? Hi there, I'll be happy to help you. Unfortunately, I don't have access to that because this is the chat page. So that kind of proves that. But if I say, what is OpenAI? There we go. Hello, I'd be happy to help you answer that question. OpenAI is a research organization dedicated to advancing artificial intelligence. And I like that. I, I actually like um, the, the idea, the concept of uh, having a co-pilot as an undocked element. You know, all of the co-pilots that you get are all a sidebar, aren't they? They all just appear, mm. but they take up a huge amount of real estate from your page. I quite like the idea of having a little floating element that just pops up when you need it and disappears again when you don't. Maybe clicking on it and you'd get uh, an input box and then you'd get the response back, but then it just disappears to a little icon at the bottom right-hand corner. I quite like that. Plus, I missed Clippy. And when I found that JavaScript uh, library there that I could include... I absolutely wanted to make sure that that was part of, of my demo. You'll find that it's actually in a, a different branch. There's a Clippy branch of the code. So if you want to see how that's working. But actually, all of Clippy wasn't the only one of these Office AI helpers that are really like the grandfather of OpenAI, if you think about it. Uh, there was all sorts of ones. There was a wizard uh, that my mate at work back in those days used to call Pete the Wizard. Um, and there's a uh, like a Formula One car and all sorts. There's loads in there that you can play with. I didn't realise there was as many as there were, but yeah, quite cool. Uh, but even so, I think non-intrusive co-pilots are the are the way forward. <laughs> but we'll see how they develop it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I see Alan says they're working on large monitor support for for co-pilot. Yeah, that'd be good. I mean, I've got a 49 inch ultra wide here, so anything they can do in that space would be good. <laughs> like that idea. Has anyone got any questions? Anything they want to ask? Uh, was anything unclear or anything you want to go over again? Or There's no questions in the chat sheet. No, blown everyone yeah. away. <laughs> Good. Well, yeah, thank you very much for, for listening. And uh, yeah, thank you for inviting me along. Um, yeah, thanks for coming. Yeah, anytime. Always good. That was very interesting. It was very intriguing. I don't do a lot with OpenAI at the moment, so it was good insight into what is possible. I really enjoyed yeah. it. Thank you. Yeah, and I really only scratched the surface on all of those things as well. There's so much more you can do, even with just the chunking part that I was talking about. We can do things called sliding window, because when you chunk things up, the smaller you chunk them, the more context you lose of the overall document. Uh, so sometimes you can just rather than chunk, 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 it can slide that chunk across and maintain some of the previous chunks data. And you can also pass each chunk through OpenAI and ask it to summarize it and add that summary to the next chunk and keep doing that all the way through. And that keeps context as well. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff even just in that. And then there's all the prompt engineering side of it to make sure that it gives you back the data in the way that you want it. Um, 
and then yeah it gets complicated <laughs> but cool and relatively doable most folks have used a database and most most folks have touched open ai chat gpt somewhere so combining those two things together to be able to go over your own data is where i think a lot of this well, we can't train our own models let's be honest you can't make your own uh gpt4 it's just not possible it takes you know, thousands and thousands of hours millions of dollars of expenditure to be able to train these models so training your own to be as good at least at inference and understanding a natural language is not practical um but combining your own data with it is is certainly practical so yeah there you go uh, thank you uh this talk will be made available on youtube as soon as we get it edited so in the next couple of days both the talks will be edited up there hopefully thank you i thank everyone for coming yeah, yeah thanks very thanks much so. yeah thank you very much see you later